So, Aaron, did you want to go first? Okay, so with this discussion of uh, ethnic divides in the Middle East, we're starting um, in the right place, I feel. Um, the situation of the Palestinian Arab minority in Israel is unique and complex. Um, I focus on what have become known as the future vision documents issued by Palestinian leaders uh, in Israel in late 2006, early 2007, addressing the inequality of the Arab minority vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish majority of the state. And I analyzed the largely critical Israeli uh, Jewish responses to those documents. I argue that the reasons behind this negative Jewish reaction are found within Israeli Jewish discourse on the character of the state, the state's relationship with the Palestinian minority, and about the Palestinian citizens of the state themselves. Um, and previously, uh, many analyses have been written about the documents themselves, and many public opinion polls have been conducted on the, uh, the viewpoint of uh, the Israeli Arabs on uh, the documents. Uh, this, however, is an analysis of the viewpoint of the um, Palestinian Arab community through the documents and how uh, Israeli Jewish discourse um, is seen through the documents and the reasons for um, the negative reaction are um, through specific themes that are found in Israeli discourse. Um, the state of Israel defines itself as a Jewish state and as a democratic state simultaneously. In practice, Israel can be called an ethnocratic state as it works as the political tool and symbolic manifestation of one national group, uh, its Jewish majority, while giving individual rights and certain collective rights to the non-Jewish Palestinian minority, uh, a fifth of the total Israeli population. Uh, in order to maintain this arrangement, however, the state must, must enact uh, policies which discriminate based on ethnicity and prevent Palestinian citizens from attaining uh, certain rights which are reserved solely for the Jewish majority. Uh, these are the inequalities which, are, uh, which the future vision documents address. These documents were published in an atmosphere witnessing a resurgence of attempts among Israeli society to forge a constitution which has been absent since uh, the creation of the state. These attempts, however, left out the viewpoint of the Palestinian minority. And Israeli Arab elites, therefore, saw it as their responsibility to include the community's excluded voice uh, in this discussion so they would not be sidelined constitutionally as they saw it. Uh, these documents are primarily uh, these four papers uh, put forward by a range of Arab organizations in Israel um, in late 0607. All of the future vision documents essentially contain the same elements. They offer the narrative of the Palestinian community, uh, detail their grievances with the state, and demand that Israel become a fully equal and democratic state. This discourse found in the documents is very revealing of uh, the Arab-Israeli view of the state and of internal social processes among, uh, within the community. The documents assert, for instance, that the land which became the state of Israel in 1948 is the homeland of the Palestinian people, and their right, therefore, to be citizens of the state uh, originates from their existence as uh, they term it as an indigenous homeland community. This right is not given, uh, endowed, or administered by the state itself. This is the foundation of the Palestinian minority's relationship to the state and the basis for demanding equal rights. Uh, the concept of citizenship is also viewed by the document uh, in a unique way, in two different ways. The first is that citizenship as it exists for Palestinian citizens lacks substance. It is not citizenship which is the determinant for the allocation of state resources, they argue, but Jewishness. On the other hand, the documents show that the Palestinian community takes citizenship very seriously and that they argue for the improvement of Israeli society and democracy through the Israeli system. This highlights the Israelization, if it can be called, of the community, uh, their use of uh, the Israeli system in this way. Palestinianization, which entails a growing association with a larger Palestinian national movement, is also clearly seen uh, in the documents uh, in different ways. Some of the demands found in the documents are merely theoretical appeals, while others are concrete recommendations. The documents assert that coexistence between Israel's Jews and, Jews and Arabs cannot be forged in an atmosphere of inequality. So what then uh, is their course of achieving this desired equality? The answer offered is twofold. Uh, first, by making the Israeli state neutral towards its citizen ethnic groups, and at the same time, uh, by allowing the Palestinian community non-territorial, cultural, religious, educational autonomy. To achieve this, some documents recommend Israel become a consensual democracy, others call for a multicultural democracy, while others call simply for equality. Finally, the documents are viewed um, overall as a call for dialogue between the Jewish majority and Palestinian minority. This means that above and beyond the specific demands made, they are an attempt to inject their voice into Israeli <coughs> civil discourse. Uh, the responses from the Israeli Jewish side, um, as I mentioned, were overwhelmingly critical of the documents. They came in the form of uh, op-eds, academic papers, uh, press statements, and reaction from the government itself. 
Um, interestingly, the Israeli political left was especially critical of the documents due to what they feel is a betrayal by the Arab sector, um, given their advocacy for that sector historically. There were, it must be mentioned, several positive uh, Jewish reactions on the part of what some call uh, the post-Zionist or anti-Zionist Jewish left. The majority, the Jewish majority rejected the documents in this way because the arguments and demands fall outside the limits of Israeli Jewish discourse on the issues discussed in the documents. There are several apparent discursive themes that lead, therefore, to the natural rejection of the documents and their perspective. The first theme, perhaps the most significant, is that Israel is and should be the Jewish state. In the most widely accepted sense, this means that the state of Israel is the national political manifestation of the Jewish people exclusively, despite the presence of a non-Jewish uh, population within its borders. The Jewish ethnic character of the state, symbolically and practically, must remain, they argue, and this means that the state cannot reflect the identity or natural, national features of its non-Jewish population. Most responses by this formula criticize the document's call for Israel to become a state not defined by this Jewish hegemony. They claim that its authors want to create uh, one and a half Palestinian states and half a Jewish state, or sometimes uh, two and a half Palestinian states and half a Jewish state if they include Jordan with, as a Palestinian state, which some of them do. This reflects sort of a corollary to the first theme, which is that Israel is not accepted as a Palestinian homeland. The authors of the responses point to a future Palestinian state, arguing that it is that entity from which the Palestinian national aspiration should derive. And if Palestinian citizens do not accept the Jewish character of the state, they can simply move to it. Further, Israeli discourse treats the Palestinian minority not as an indigenous community, but as if it were an immigrant community, like the other Jewish and non-Jewish immigrant communities who voluntarily came to the state over time. And some Israeli policies reflect this. Another theme is that the Jewish character of the state is more important in practice than its democratic character. Some responses argue that there is no significant or most responses argue that there's no significant contradiction between the two, um, but, and there was always that poss possibility, but if it comes down to it, the Jewish character of the state is, in the end, the reason for its creation. And while democracy is ideal, it cannot diminish this Jewish character. Taking this further, non-democratic means can therefore be legitimized if necessary to ensure that the Jewish character is not compromised. And some Israeli politicians um, have stated this uh, directly or indirectly in the past. The next theme comes primarily from the center left, saying that the Arab problem within the state is primarily socioeconomic and not national. This argument admits that the socioeconomic problem is indeed a serious one, and that the state has been largely at fault in many ways. This perspective sees the situation, however, as easily fixable uh, with enough funding without a complete overhaul of the state system. Arab complaints against the state adopt national rhetoric only because the socioeconomic situation is so poor, but they are also manipulated by nationalists with dubious intentions. These arguments, however, often ignore the fact that policies causing the declining socioeconomic conditions in the Israeli Arab sector are or have been, for the most part, intentional. On the deeper level, this shows that in mainstream Jewish discourse, Palestinian citizens are not seen as representing part of a real national group making legitimate claims. This is arguably rooted even further in rhetoric about Palestinians not being a real nation, espoused by figures such as Golda Meir uh, and others in the past. From the perspective of the center left, the Arab community has been fully Israelized, the, Palestinian, the Palestinianization of the community represented by these documents is seen as a process of radicalization rather than further national affiliation. The final major theme uh, is that the minority is part of the larger Palestinian and Arab enemy and is a potential fifth column within the state. This comes especially from the center right. Uh, and these responses see the future vision documents themselves as, quote, a declaration of war and, quote, the attempt to destroy the state by other means. Perhaps the most notable response of all to the documents came from the Israeli Prime Minister's office itself. In a letter sent to one of the authors, it stated that, quote, the Shin Bet Security Service will thwart the activity of any group or individual seeking to harm the Jewish and democratic character of the state, even if, if such activ activity is sanctioned by the law. This comment essentially speaks for itself and is reflective of that discourse, describing uh, the minority as a, quote, st strategic threat to the state's Jewishness and therefore to the state itself. Uh, additionally, the increasing level of discriminatory, dehumanizing uh, language used in uh, politics today, uh, especially among the Israeli right, and the rise of the Israeli right signals the continuation of such uh, themes well into the future. Uh, the rejection of the future vision documents as a beginning of a call for dialogue, not even just the rejection of the demands made specifically, is a clear sign that the Jewish majority and the state is not prepared to allow the Palestinian minority a significant role in building a more equitable state and society. This has additional ramifications for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, conflict at large and for Jewish-Arab reconciliation. 
So unless there is a shift uh, in this discourse, there will be continued deterioration of majority-minority relations within the state, and without a doubt, continued inequality. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Daniel, do you want to go next? All right. Uh, my name is Daniel Magalotti, and I'm a junior in the Elliott School, majoring in Middle Eastern Studies. Um, in 1996, the Islamic movement in Israel, which represents a party espousing political Islam in the state, split over the issue of participation in the Knesset elections. While some authors have uh, described the split as based on competing uh, leadership qualities or other ideas, I've, I have found that there are actually deeper issues of identity that cause the split, namely that the Islamic movement occupied a space of identity, identity that was too large and split between civil, religious, and national factors. Because identity was the root of the split, the implications mean that the split was both inevitable and lasting, and the branches are unlikely to reconcile in the future. For methodology, I used uh, the actions and rhetoric of the leaders from books, journal article, articles, news articles, and interviews with some leaders. So uh, as Aaron mentioned, about 20% of Israel's citizens are actually Arab, of which 83% are Muslims. But historically, Muslims have actually been underrepresented in the political leadership. However, Aaron also mentioned that because Israel defines itself as a Jewish state, Arabs have an unequal status, and they live in what is termed either an ethnic democracy or, or ethnocracy. Uh, many, uh, many scholars have attempted to model Arab-Israeli identity because of their unequal status, but I believe that past models of Arab-Israeli identity fail for two reasons. First, religion is not properly accounted for, meaning that religion is not treated as a separate uh, characteristic of identity. And second, there's no fluidity in other models. Other models tend to create definite streams of identity, which do not, do not allow Arab Israelis to occupy multiple versions of identity, and thus they can't change identities very easily, which is not true in the real world. And so because of this, I found it necessary to come up with a new framework for identity, which I have modeled as a uh, triangle behind me. There are three factors that contribute to identity, namely civil or Israeli identity, religious, or in this case, Islamic identity, and national or Arab or Palestinian identity. All Arab Israelis would fit somewhere in this triangle, and unless they are along one of the edges, they would have some influence from all three identities, though the influences would vary based on where they are in the triangle. So in terms of Islamism in the um, land we now call Israel, um, during the Palestinian mandate, the Muslim Brotherhood was the first instance of political Islam uh, in the land. Um, however, from the beginning, political Islam took on both religious and national characteristics. Uh, for example, Hassan al-Banna, the uh, leader of the Muslim Brotherhood, actually asked the Coptic Patriarch in Egypt to help stop Jewish immigration to the state, showing that there are both Arab and Islamic considerations in defending Palestine. After the 1967 war, political Islam began to reemerge in the state of Israel for two reasons. Uh, first, there were general trends towards political Islam in the Middle East, such as the Islamic Revolution in Iran and the death of Pan-Arabism. And uh, most importantly, though, the opening up of contacts across the Green Line after 1967 meant that Muslims living in Israel could reconnect with Muslims living in the West Bank and Gaza Strip who had been in contact with uh, political Islam for the last 20 years. So, Political Islam uh, in Israel was first organized in, the, in a group called Usrat al-Jihad, or Family of the Struggle. It was organized in the late 1970s and early 1980s, and was a fairly radical group that actually rejected the existence of the State of Israel. They used violent, act, uh, violent methods, such as burning down cinemas, they found to screen inappropriate films. Um, and as you can see on the model, they're represented by using mainly religious and some national characteristics, and an, an entire rejection of civil characteristics of identity. However, in the early 1980s, the Israeli government arrested most of the leaders, and when, most, and when the leaders emerged from prison, they accepted the exist existence of the state of Israel, showing uh, that their identity shifted towards a more civil-based civil identity. So from 1983 to 1996, there was a united Islamic movement in Israel. Um, as compared to Usrat al-Jihad, the united movement clearly showed more civil and national characteristics. On a national level, they participated in Arab institutions, such as the Committee of Arab Local Council Heads. And on the civil level, they ran in local elections and worked with the state on funding issues for their local municipalities. However, as I will show, the, the identity that they occupied was too large to be stable, and thus a split occurred in 1996. 
So in 1996, uh, the issue came about participating in the Knesset elections. This issue had been brought up in the 1992 and previous elections before that. But finally in 1996, the movement's high council voted to actually run for the elections. Um, this caused a split with the southern branch embracing the more civil and national identity, while the northern branch, which rejected participation in the elections, embraced a more religious identity. Today, there are actually two Islamic movements in Israel split on the issue of Knesset elections. So the southern branch uh, is shown to embrace a more civil identity because they, in order to run for the Knesset elections, you have to actually recognize Israel, at least implicitly, as both a Jewish and democratic state. So by recognizing them as a Jewish state, they are in a way embracing civil identity. However, the northern branch uh, is mainly based on religious identity. They rejected participation based on religious doctrines and fatwas issued by ulama in the rest of the Arab world. Since 1996, the identities of the two branches have only been cemented. For example, the southern branch still recognizes Israel as a Jewish and democratic state. Furthermore, they perform official Israeli business. Um, for example, in the past, Islamic movement leaders who serve in the Knesset have visited Israel or have visited Arab nations such as Jordan as part of official Israeli delegations meaning they feel themselves as representative of the Israeli state in a civil fashion. Meanwhile, the northern branch has also shifted more towards uh, the religious identity. Most of their activities are now focused on saving the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a clear religious dimension. Uh, furthermore, they have shifted away even more from civil identity, testing the limits of legal action. Uh, they, for example, during the October 2000 events, or the run-up to the Second Intifada in uh, in Israel, there were riots in the Arab sector. Um, Sheikh Salah, who's the leader of the Northern Branch, was cited by the Or Commission, which was the commission set up in the aftermath of the riots to investigate them. Um, Sheikh Salah was, was incited by, or was reported by the Or Commission to be inciting violence in the Arab sector, testing the limits of uh, the legal boundaries of the movement, showing that they did not respect civil identity as much. So the conclusion from uh, my, my findings on this triangular framework of identity is first uh, a question of state coercion versus incentives and the radical versus mainstream identity. Uh, it's my belief that within the triangle you can draw a smaller triangle um, for mainstream identity and then the outer triangle would be radical identity. For radical identity, state coercion such as arresting leaders and forcing them to go to prison would actually work in moderating their identity because most Arab Israelis themselves would find them radical. However, within the smaller triangle, which Arab Israelis would accept as mainstream political identity, uh, state coercive actions such as uh, arresting the leader of the northern branch um, earlier this decade actually had a negative effect in that Arab Israelis rallied behind the leader because he was seen as mainstream by uh, most Arab Israelis. Furthermore, this has the implication of showing that identity can actually be too large to be stable. As I showed, the United Islamic Movement occupied a space of identity that was too large, and thus it split, uh, caught a split that was inevitable and has been lasting. Uh, finally, in terms of application of this framework, unfortunately the framework cannot really be applied to other countries in the Middle East, as civil, uh, civil and national identities are really the same thing in other countries because there's no minorities. And in some cases, like Saudi Arabia, civil, national, and religious identity is essentially the same thing. However, it could be applied to uh, Muslim minorities in Western Europe, Europe even, or even the United States, where their religious and national identities at times can conflict with the civil identity created by the state. Thank you, Daniel. Katrina, you're next. So I'm going to shift course a bit and uh, bring our discussion on conflict in the Middle East a bit further east to Iraq. Uh, I'm looking at the structure of violence, particularly in conflicts between groups and violence in conflicts within groups. To do so, I chose two civil conflicts in Iraq, one the Sunni-Shia conflict and the other the Kurdish conflict in the 1990s. The most significant difference that I found in between these conflicts was the direction that resources and loyalty flowed from the supporters to the leaders. Uh, in the Kurdish conflict, the leaders distributed resources and created systems of patronage. In the Sunni-Shia conflict, the leaders grew to be more extractive and um, extracted resources and loyalty from their supporters. In the latter case, it was thus easier to develop incentives to end violence because the extractive nature eroded support for the continuation of conflict. 
So I'm briefly going to talk about the resources that I used to set up my paper, talk a bit more about my findings, and then the implications um, of my research. So I looked at past literature on conflict and civil war to analyze what factors other authors saw as contributing to the emergence and longevity of conflict. Uh, four factors kept on reoccurring in describing these conflicts, and these are the four factors that I'm going to take and apply to the, my case studies. Uh, the political context, in conflict that revolves mainly around discussions of anarchy and the security dilemma that develops on how groups interact in such um, a system. The leaders, because they provide a guiding factor and control how resources are distributed. Motivations such as greed, security, uh, religious and ethnic hatred do contribute to um, the character of the conflict as well. And also the character of the resources if uh, they can be easily um, looted or how the channels that they are distributed uh, is important to study in conflict. So I'm going to first describe the Kurdish Civil War. This occurred after the first U.S. Gulf invasion and so you had the U.S. protecting the northern region of Iraq and also giving lots of money and aid. Uh, in this region, there was no centralizing power. However, two leaders emerged as kind of the political hegemons. Uh, Barzani, who was head of the Kurdish Democratic Party, and Talibani, who was head of the uh, Patriotic Union of Kurdistan. Uh, the motivations that fueled this conflict were not so much uh, ideological, rather a desire to control for power. Uh, although there are some slight differences between these parties, for example, Barzani is said to be more traditional versus Talibani is the more urban representative. Um, they, you also have to keep in mind the context in which this region was coming from. Any internal differences would conceivably be minor in comparison to the, the, the decades of, of external oppression they faced under Saddam Hussein, so their Kurdish identity uh, should have been, would co uh, conceivably be stronger than any of their internal differences. Um, also important to note is the way that resources flowed into the region during this time. Uh, Saddam had this region under an embargo, so there was very few channels that um, goods were able to, allowed to enter Kurdistan. Uh, because of this, taxes from the respective border crossings were very lucrative and this is when tension began growing between the two parties because Talibani became convinced that Barzani was holding back on his, um, on sharing tax revenues. Uh, a local land conflict then further developed into violence and a civil war started in 1994. Uh, the way that this war progressed is interesting because both leaders uh, empowered local warlords and gave them resources to continue the conflict. So they almost outsourced the conflict to um, local strongmen and uh, in so had a very interesting effect on the way that uh, support and resources were passed down from the leaders to their supporters. Uh, the conflict came to an end in about 1998 when Barzani went to Saddam Hussein and asked for help and Talibani went to Iran and asked for help in defeating the other side. Uh, and you ha in this situation, the U.S. government found the very people it was protecting were going to the two most anti-American governments in the world seeking support to defeat each other. So they brought them to Washington and um, forced an agreement called the Washington Agreement. There has been conflict since then, but it has largely been political rather than violent. And now you'll see the same kind of strong U.S. influence in the Sunni and Shia civil war that had a, played a large part in determining the political context in which this occurred. Uh, with the U.S. invasion, it created a system of anarchy where there was no centralizing power. Um, and the civil war between these groups drew in, it was initially um, formed from the insurgency. They, it was mainly an effort to get the U.S. out, and you had radical Sunnis and radical Shias fighting U.S. forces. However, in about 2004, there was the thinking that instead of attacking the U.S., if they attacked each other, that would draw the conflict into civil war and the U.S. would most likely pull out. Um, and th this, as you can see, the resources, the, uh, the motivation, sorry, <laughs> um, driving this conflict was more, were more about political control and using ethnicity and sectarian differences as a means to achieve these political goals. 
the apex of the conflict and its, its height was uh, the bombing of the Samara Mosque and then the subsequent Battle of Baghdad that followed. Um, in this, you had uh, Sunni Al-Qaeda um, radicals bombing the mosque and then a large-scale Shia retaliation. Um, and this is when the conflict grew to be particularly extractive. Both militias used civilians as a means for security, hiding behind them from each other and the coalition forces, and also grew to extract um, taxes, resources, and um, other forms of loyalty from their population. I'm just gonna mention an example that will really highlight it, and this is actually the turning point uh, for the Sunni, um, I guess, participation in this conflict. There was a dis marriage dispute between Al-Qaeda leaders and the Sunni tribal sheikhs, where the Sunnis didn't want, the, the, the Sunni leaders didn't want their daughters marrying Al-Qaeda foreign fighters. Uh, in response to this, Al-Qaeda mailed these tribal leaders the heads of their sons. So this just emphasizes the very extractive nature that the, um, the, the leaders of these conflicts had. So the important thing to note is the implications of these conflicts and how they're structured is for third party actors. In one case, in this case, um, an increase of money and security with the US surge could provide a powerful incentive to end conflict. In the other case, increasing money and security in the region in Kurdistan in particular, only enabled the, combat, the combatants to continue fighting. So this really under, um, underlines the utility of ex examining group dynamics within conflict, because the way that leaders interact with their supporters can play a large role in what kind of solutions are possible. So. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to just ask um, sort of a broad question that um, hopefully each of you can answer on your research, and then I can open it up to you guys. Um, how do you each feel that your research and um, your analysis can help better inform and better guide current government policies, whether it's US policy, whether it's Israeli policy, or Katrina, for you, maybe the new Iraqi government? Uh, yeah, so even though the, uh, the Future Vision documents were published three, four years ago, the issues behind them are still, uh, still standing and definitely have implications for uh, U.S. policy relating to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict in general and also for uh, Israeli policy uh, domestically. Um, in terms of Israeli policy, the documents, the major argument is that uh, the Israeli government should uh, recognize the narrative and grievances of the Palestinian community, even if it doesn't recognize the demands made in the, in the documents. Uh, and this is something that is still ongoing within Israeli society, that uh, Arab NGOs, uh, organizations within the country are trying to uh, inject the Palestinian voice into Israeli civil discourse. And uh, the ramifications of that can only be seen in light of the second factor, which is uh, policy towards the Israeli Palestinian conflict on the part of the international uh, community, specifically the U.S. Um, one of the uh, one of the issues that could arise uh, if the Obama administration, for in instance, uh, pursues uh, a policy of trying to um, bring back negotiations on uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that the uh, Palestinian-Israeli community within the country um, can start uh, or might start voicing their demands. Uh, more or start voicing their grievances more strongly uh, than the past in order for their future not to be determined by uh, the PA uh, in Palestine or by the Israeli government um, in the end of these negotiations. So uh, the discourse, the themes are very important uh, on the Israeli side to recognize and also the ramifications that, uh, that, uh, these, that the discourse, uh, ongoing discourse on both the Palestinian and uh, Palestinian, Israeli, and Jewish-Israeli side have for uh, Israeli domestic policy and U.S. Uh, policy is very significant. All right, well, uh, mine's based more in theoretical uh, frameworks, but in terms of policy implications, I think it just better informs the, Isra the Israeli government of the identity of, the, uh, of its Arab citizens, especially um, right now in Israel, there is no Arab community. They're defined as either Muslim, Druze, Christian community. 
And so um, that groups them more into religious, a more religious basis rather than a national basis. So for example, if Israel were to grant rights to an, or grant recognition of an Arab community, it could allow some of the grievances of, of not only Arabs, but also um, Muslims in Israel to, to air their grievances and have better relations with the state. Um, outside Israel, I think um, this framework could be applied in terms of showing uh, why certain groups act in opposition to the state, uh, especially Muslim groups in Western Europe and even the United States. Um, especially uh, in Western Europe where a lot of times they're defined as the other, but in fact their identity is based on both civil, on civil, national, and religious factors. And a lot of times, for example, the French government or the British government does not take this into account on how they uh, treat their uh, Muslim citizens. Um, well, I think it's uh, it's interesting. The, the implications are interesting for this region because in the Middle East, uh, past interactions are very much a huge component of the future group dynamics. Um, and these conflicts are in, that I was talking about are in no way means over. They have just shifted from being violent to the political arena. Uh, so that creates two different... Um, interesting dynamics for U.S. and for the Iraqi governments. For the U.S., it's important to be proactive about understanding past history because now there's no longer going to be the, um, the ability to manage from the ground level. You, there is going to be an increasing um, need to stop things from ha to be proactive and recognize if these conflicts are getting violent <coughs> and ways to stop that di diplomatically rather than now militarily. Uh, for the Iraqi government, it's, it's also important to recognize and account for the past history and the deep scars that these, conflict has ha that these conflicts have had um, on their community. Thank you. Um, questions from the audience. So there's one back there and one over here if you want to. I really like that, that schematic. Um, I thought that was really cool on a way to, I, and I was wondering what sort of theoretical or epistemological tradition um, you drew from to create that and just your specific methodology for coming up with that. I'm just very curious on graphical representations of ideas like that. Uh, sure, well first to go into existing frameworks, um, a lot of Arab-Israeli uh, scholars have come up with other frameworks. For example, uh, Sami Smuha uses a four-fold classification of acceptance, aggression, avoidance, assimilation, but that doesn't really take into account religion because um, people who oppose the state or disagree with the state because of religious factors could uh, be in the, in the aggression, the avoidance, or the assimilation category. Um, others, such as uh, Assad Ghanem, have done um, an Arab-Israeli stream, a communist stream, a national stream, and an Islamist stream. And that, that's better in that religion is included, but he doesn't make it so that someone who espouses political Islam also espouses Arab nationalism. So I found that there were, I mean, I'm sure the framework could be expanded to include other factors, but for simplicity's sake, I included three factors, which are national, religious, and civil factors. Um, because as an Arab living in the state of Israel, you are essentially um, an Israeli citizen, a member of the Arab nation, and a member of a certain religion, uh, namely either Islam, Christianity, or you are Druze. So I, I found that having, an, having these three factors work off each other and, uh, having, and showing that how an Arab Israeli could you know, incorporate characteristics of all three factors to varying degrees was important in creating a, a, a theoretical framework for explaining their identity. Thank you, next question. I know you have one up here. Thank you. Uh, my question's for Katrina. So I'm still trying to gauge a uh, better understanding of the conflict in Iraq before 2007. And you mentioned the, um, I guess, kind of sort of call for internal conflict in 2004 as a means of uh, getting the U.S. to exit. Um, can you talk a little bit about how those sectarian leaders were able to encourage um, individuals to start performing those acts and fighting against each other? Yeah, sure. Um, I didn't talk a lot about in this one about the conflict structure, so I'm just going to um, brief on that. Uh, what's important to note that unlike the Kurdish conflict, there weren't any leaders. There wasn't any any um, 
leaders that were considered the le legitimate leader of the entire Sunni or the entire Shia population. What you had were groups of actors um, that were more united in their um, in their unity of um, uh, in the unity of per uh, vague unity of purpose rather than a unity of um, control and like operational. Um, Operational uh, synchronization, like they, none of uh, there wasn't so much cooperation among them, and there was also a lot of infighting. However, what guided a lot of um, a lot of attacks was they just kept on going for big targets that they knew would get a lot of retaliationary retaliationary strikes, and they kept going and you know doing very hideous things until finally. Uh, with the bombing of the Samara Mosque, that was really the turning point when before then uh, the Shias had mainly been on the defensive. They retaliated, but they weren't typically, um, they didn't really typically commit offensive actions. Uh, so that's how it kind of escalated. There was no real strategic guideline that all the, the Sunni groups used to collaborate on, on these attacks. It was more kind of ad hoc, um, ad hoc terrorist activity. Thank you. Any other questions? I have some I can throw in here. There is one in the back. Hi, Katrina. I'm going to cheat a little bit because uh, I've been looking at your paper for three months. Um, <laughs> a quick question on the, the, the role of the surge, because uh, from a policy-related standpoint, that could have major implications to, on our future uh, governance decisions um, and how to basically approach these conflicts. In your research, um, have you looked at any specific parts of the surge, the military side, the political side, um, civilian capacity development roles? Which part of the surge do you think, I mean, obviously, as a whole, it probably had a great impact, but which portions of the surge do you think were most critical? Uh, well, to me, there are sort of two components about, of the surge that were uh, critical. One was providing security for the population, the, um, the civilian population. These are the people that were being exploited by their leaders. Um, the leaders were using them for security rather than providing them with adequate security. So ha by having the U.S. A actively come in, um, establish um, strong, a uh, strong presence on the ground, that, that was able to um, give the civilians the security to defect from their leaders and not suffer retaliation to some extent. Um, Another big component of the surge was with funding the Sons of Iraq. I thought that that was, those go hand in hand as being the two most effective elements of, of the surge. Um, there's, a, there's a good quote that I came upon in my research by Stephen Biddle saying that if we gave all Iraqis $300 at the beginning of the, at the, beginning of the, uh, the war, that would be the best use of American taxpayer money. But that wasn't possible at that time because the situation, like the political situation wasn't such that the civilians would accept that and um, be more receptive to the American presence. It was, it was a large, it was very, um, the surge was a very timely, um, it came at a very a good time that was beneficial to its success. So um, the fun, giving the people an out in terms of funding, in terms of providing for their livelihood as well as security, were the two main components of the surge that uh, were able to garner significant results. Any other questions? I can throw one in here. Um, Daniel, you mentioned in your model for um, talking about um, Arab-Israeli identity, how do you think that, or do you think the lack of a Palestinian state sort of complicates um, how Arab-Israelis think of themselves, and do you think that adopting a Palestinian state will, how do you think adopting a Palestinian state is going to factor in with identity? In terms of the, the lack of a Palestinian state, I think it kind of um, increases the attachment to Arab-Israeli identity because uh, I mean, in Israel, because obviously they don't have a state to be attached to, so they have to kind of um, group themselves into a, into a nation right now. Um, if a state were to be established, uh, I mean, I think uh, there are a lot of Arabs in Israel, and they're not, ob they're not gonna leave if a, state, if a Palestinian state is established in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They're still gonna be citizens of Israel. 
I think the international community will unfortunately forget about them because they have a, there's a Palestinian state and they won't even remember that there are Palestinians living in Israel still. So I think international support will lessen, but um, their concerns will be just as legitimate whether there's a Palestinian state or not because the Israeli government still describes itself and will continue to describe itself as a Jewish state, which automatically makes um, causes discrimination against its Arab citizens. Uh, maybe I can throw one at Aaron just so I can get you talking. Do you want me to address that one too? Yeah, go for it. Go. Okay. Uh, well, the future vision documents were very clear on how the community views the creation of a Palestinian state and how that uh, creation would affect their status uh, within Israel itself. Um, arguing that they are an indigenous homeland community within this, what is now the state of Israel itself and arguing that um, their attachment is to that particular land, not necessarily to uh, the Jewish character uh, of the state of Israel. They argue that in the documents that there should be a two-state solution uh, to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, and they argue that very strongly. Um, they don't, however, consider, and they consider the, um, that the Israeli government addresses the concerns of the Palestinian minority within the state, a critical component um, which might lead to the creation of that separate Palestinian state. But the process of Israelization that has occurred since 1948 um, over time uh, is seen through the documents and affects how the Palestinian minority within the state uh, views a potential Palestinian state. And in the actually in the responses to the Jewish responses, um, you know, accuse the um, Israeli Jewish majority of wanting to, um, you know, make the Israeli state completely uh, Arab free by transferring basically either sovereignty of Arab areas to a new Palestinian state or by physically transferring uh, part of the Israeli uh, Arab minority. Uh, but they, they make it clear that they are Israeli citizens and they will remain Israeli citizens, but they want Israeli citizenship to be meaningful for the Palestinian minority uh, in the future, even with the creation of a future Palestinian state. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.